Uh, but thank you all so much for, for coming tonight. I'm, I'm really excited to see uh, so many people here. And uh, in, a, in a talk like this, as you probably imagine, uh, talking about iconography, uh, at seminary they teach a whole uh, semester, if not more than that, on iconography. So, what I can cover in about 20 minutes, I will. Uh, but the, the big thing I'm going to try to do is to uh, just kind of give you some overview and uh, hopefully uh, an appreciation of iconography for what it, it's meant to do. And uh, Dr. Gray, when we were going through the iconography exhibit, or the Chapman exhibit downstairs, uh, told me that uh, he was really attempting to search for truth. And I think the, the title of the, the whole series itself is Truth and Identity, if I'm not mistaken. And so it, it's a great thing to search for the truth. And artists do that particularly with their art. Writers do that with their writing. They seek for the truth. The big thing for us to do is to seek the truth. And I, I as a priest, will tell you, uh, seek truth. <laughs> seek truth. And, and as, as an Orthodox priest, I'll tell you, truth exists. So we really do seek after that absolute truth. And the whole thing with icons uh, is that while you have artists who are uh, seeking the truth, iconography is meant to present the truth. They are meant to give us exactly what truth actually is. And so that, that's a difference in what art is and what an icon is. Icons are often called windows to heaven because they open up a door to something different, to something bigger, to something uh, beyond what we might be able to understand. So they are meant to provide and present to us truth. They are meant to present to us truth. Truth, and so that that's the perhaps the most important thing for me uh, to say. So I have this great quote here, and if you don't remember anything else tonight from what I say, remember everything Arthur says. <laughs> if you don't remember anything else that I say tonight, make sure to remember this because this is the the, the clearest thing to say of what icons are meant to do. Icons do with color what scripture does with words. Icons do with color what scripture does with words. And this is from the fathers of the Seventh Ecumenical Council. Now, if you don't know church history, that's okay. The Seventh Ecumenical Council occurred in Nicaea in 787. And it was uh, the last of the ecumenical councils and from the Orthodox understanding. And at that council was where they determined that it was good and holy for the church to use icons to use them in the worship, to put them up on the walls uh, in the churches, to put them up on the walls at our homes so that we can see it. And it's, it's, uh, the reason we can do it is all about the incarnation. Do you know what I mean when I say the word incarnation? The taking on of flesh of the Son of God. That's what the, the church means by saying incarnation. So we can actually have an icon because you can see Christ physically. They didn't have iPhones back in those days. But if they did, he could have taken a selfie and posted it to Facebook and tweeted it out to the world. But he didn't. But we have icons today because he could have. Because he really took on flesh and was everything that it is to be human. This divine person, the Son of God, everything that it is to be human so we can actually depict him in the icon. Okay, so that's why we can and why the Father said, icons do with color what Scripture does with words. Now, what does Scripture do with words? You can tell me. What does Scripture do with words if, if, from a Christian perspective? Teaches us. Teaches us. Reveals the truth. Reveals the truth to us. Exactly. It gives us an understanding, teaches us about who God is, Right? Perhaps first and foremost, we think it teaches us about who God is. But secondly, uh, Scripture also is meant to tell us about our relationship with God, what God has done for us and continues to do for us. And so if an icon does with colors what Scripture does with words, then an icon has to do those two things as well. It has to reveal the truth, some sort of truth about God, and then it also has to reveal a truth about our interaction with God, our relationship with God. 
has to have both of those things in it. Okay, so if it's going to present truth, it's going to have both of those things in it. So because I can't show you as many icons as I would love to show you, because there are many beautiful icons out there, and if you'd like to see more, you can come to our church <laughs> and see icons there uh, on ERAS Landry Archangel Gabriel Orthodox Church, my commercial for the day. But I, what I will show you is we're going to look at the icon of the resurrection. The icon of the resurrection of Christ as an example of how icons do with color, what scripture does with words. How icons reveal a truth about God and re reveal a truth about ourselves and our relationship with God. Okay, so I'm going to focus on the icon of the resurrection. Now you'll see a whole bunch of different icons of the resurrection out there. If you were to Google image it, you'll see a whole bunch of them. Uh, I just chose a couple of them, this one and, and one other one, uh, just my own personal choices. Uh, but what I have to say will pretty much go for all of them, okay? Because again, icons do with color, what scripture does with words. So there are particular rules that have to apply. I can't, and you're lucky I can't because I'm just not an artist, I've been told that there are a few iconographers that are here, I can't just go and paint a picture and say, this is an icon. Okay, there, it has to have specific uh, figures, specific colors, uh, specific ways that the figures are um, actually uh, shaped what they are doing, the symbols that are in the icons, that's what makes sure to make it still presenting the truth. Because the difference between an icon then and what uh, Chapman's art is, uh, again, that seeking for truth doesn't have the same laws, doesn't have the same rules about what it means to present that truth, but icons do. Okay, icons do. So here we have an icon of the resurrection. Now, first of all, you might be surprised that this is an icon of the resurrection. Right? When you think of the moment of the resurrection, you think of an empty tomb, right? Or Christ coming out of an empty tomb. Well, nobody saw that event. And an icon is not necessarily meant to show a historical moment. Now, don't get me wrong, especially since this is being recorded, I'm not saying that the resurrection is not a historical event. I would have to take this off and go home if I, if I said that. It is a historical event, but the moment of the resurrection that reveals what that truth is about what the resurrection means is what is presented here and not someone, what Christ walking out of the empty tomb. That would be more of what a religious art would be. It's, it's not meant to be a historical picture, and we can go into all kinds of details about that uh, later on. So first of all, we want to say, what does, the, what does the icon say about God? Well, the central focus of the icon is this person here, and of course, I'm sure you can guess who that is. This is Christ. Okay, Christ is depicted in white. Normally, in, in icons, he's wearing red and blue because of his interaction between uh, the divinity and taking on the, the humanity uh, in the incarnation. But in the resurrection, that humanity is transformed. It is transformed in glory. And so you have Christ depicted here, and one way that you know that it's Christ, in the halo, there's a cross. And in nobody else in, in iconography, is there a cross in the halo like that? You always know that that's Christ, and that's probably self-explanatory. But what you might want to know about is you see there, there are three letters here, and they're written in Greek. So we have uh, Omicron, Omega, Nu, O. Ho'on is in Greek. And what that basically means is the one who is. And sometimes you'll see in uh, English language icons, you'll see the words I am. Those three letters, I am, written in the halo there. Because that's telling us something about who Christ is. The one who is. The great I am. And if you know your scripture, then you know that Christ himself says before Abraham was... I am, and they wanted to stone him. They wanted to stone him because by saying Ho'on, he was equating himself with God because that was the name that the voice from the burning bush gave to Moses. When Moses says, who am I supposed to say 
descending me. And the voice says, hold on, the existing one, I am. And so he's equating himself with that person. And so in this icon, we know that that same person who spoke to Moses out of the burning bush, took on flesh, died, and rose again from the dead. Okay, and around him, we have what's called the mandorla, where there's, there's the Holy Spirit, the presence of, of the Holy Spirit as well, and the light emanating out forth from him. So the light in the icon doesn't come from the outside. The light from the icon actually comes from within, the light of the world. And so uh, even thinking about the book of Revelation, and, and it says that in the, the new heaven and the new earth, there's no sun because there isn't a need for any light because the Lamb is the light. Well, that's revealed to us here. That truth is revealed to us in the person of Christ, in the icon of the resurrection. Because he is the light of the world. Okay, so that's that's some really uh, basic things about what it says about God. That he took on flesh, the eternal word of God, the Son of God who spoke to Moses, takes on flesh, he dies, and he goes to Hades. And here this is this is Hades, forgive me for not saying that before. Goes to Hades. You have the doors of Hades that are are in the shape of the cross because, of course, he does the work through the cross. And you have him destroying the gates of Hades, releasing those that are there, and binding them. And so here is a personification of death that is bound because in the Orthodox Church, the most famous hymn that we sing on Holy Pascha, which is what we call Easter, is Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and upon those in the tombs bestowing life. And so he's is destroying death. And so it tells us that about God as well, that this same God who is in the heavens goes to Hades, opens those doors, binds and destroys death, and is able to then bring us out with him. Okay, so that's what this icon reveals about God. Now what about us? What about ourselves? What does this say about us? Well, there are other people here in the iconography. You might be able to picture them. This year, any guesses on, on who that might be? John the Baptist. John the Baptist, he's often depicted with green and a kind of a hairy shirt. Remember in the, in the scriptures, he wears camel's hair and he eats locusts and wild honey and all of that. Uh, so it's John the Baptist. Who do you think these figures might be? They have crowns on their heads. King David. King Saul. Okay, you might guess Constantine and Helen, they're, they're uh, kings, but it's not that. Think Old Testament. David, Solomon. David and Solomon. David and Solomon are the kings that are depicted here. What about on this side? This is probably even harder. A young man with a staff. Who is the first person, this one's David, who is the first person to die? Abel. Abel. Abel is the first person to die, right? Adam and Eve had Cain and Abel, their children, and of course the story is Cain kills Abel. Well, this is Abel, the first person to die, standing there next to Christ. And then who do you think these people are? That's, that's hard. Long white beard. Who might be a long white beard? Old Testament. Abraham. Elijah. Could be Abraham. I'm thinking more of prophets, Elijah and Moses. Because they're representative that the prophets were all looking for Christ. They were all looking for Christ. Everything that we read about in the Old Testament is all about Christ. And so we have all of these people looking at Christ. Now you see, everybody is looking at Christ except for John. Why not? Why not yeah. John? Looking back, pointing to Christ. Looking back, but pointing to Christ. Like what? Like he's introducing. Like Icons do with color what scripture does with words. He's introducing Christ. John the Baptist's role is the forerunner, right? He dies even before Christ. His head is chopped off, right? We have that story in, in uh, the Gospels. So John is the forerunner for Christ. 
in this world, but according to the iconography and the tradition of the church, John is the forerunner for Christ even in the world to come. Because he goes into Hades and he preaches then to the guys that are already there, because this isn't hell, this is Hades, the place where all the dead go. And he preaches to them and says, guess what, your wait is over, he's coming. And then look, he comes. And so introducing, preparing the way for Christ. Okay, so, so it, this is a description then of, of Hades, that place where all of the dead go. Now here's the really fun part. We've learned about, you're laughing at me, that's great. We've learned about what this icon shows about God and his, and his great work of the destruction of death. And then we get to see what it means for us. Now we have these two figures here. Who do you think they might be? Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve are being taken out of what? Tombs. They're being taken out of the graves. Now, notice something about Adam and Eve. What's different about Adam and Eve than about the rest of the figures that are there? No halos. No halos. And that's not a, it's not a judgment on Adam and Eve about their sanctity. It's not a judgment about who, uh, whether or not they were righteous people, because they very well could have repented, and I'm sure that they did. They had plenty of years to repent. Uh, repented of, of their disobedience, which is more really what we all do, and they're being raised. The reason they don't have halos is that we know that these are unique people, but Adam and Eve are there to represent all of us. Adam, in scripture, the word Adam, his name literally means man. And Eve, in the Greek, it's Zoe, which means life. And so Eve is the mother of all of the living. So it's man and the mother of all of the living. So it's all of us. It's all of us that are represented in the persons of Adam and Eve that are there, and they're being taken out of Hades. Now, how is Christ holding on to them? By the wrists. When you think about somebody reaching out and, and pulling you up, right, you grab hold of their hand like that, right? They reach out to you, and you grab hold. That's not what happens in the resurrection. It's not about our grabbing hold. It's about God. It's about Christ grabbing hold and raising us up. Because all of the dead are raised. All of the dead are raised. Whether we like it or not, all of the dead will be raised on the last day. And so he grabs hold of their wrists and he brings them up with them. Now it doesn't mean that Adam and Eve aren't participating in that event. Look at their hands here. Supplication. He's grabbing hold with one, his wrist is being taken up, and he's, he's offering up his hand in the other. He is asking for help. Look, I have nothing. I have nothing. Help me. And Christ takes him up. So there's that supplication that is happening. You can see it a little bit better, and that's why I put this other icon of the resurrection up in this icon. Because Christ has his hand full in this one, he's got the cross, so it shows the, the cross and the, the, uh, the means of his death. Adam has his hand out in supplication, and Eve is bowing and asking God for help. Bowing and asking God for help. And so this is what, uh, to show us about ourselves, what our role is, Inter to intercede with God, to ask for God's mercy, to ask for God's help, and expect and hope for the resurrection from the dead. And I hope that this, that's an exciting uh, moment for you and to look at this icon and say, wow, it says all of that in here? And this is just one icon? A picture is worth a thousand words, right? That's true. It's true. And icons do with color what scripture does with words. And so we can seek the truth in our art but icons, with their, their specific rules, with their specific uh, uh, layout of how to present truth, present truth to us. Present truth to us in a very profound and real way.
that's meant to be transformative for us. So we learn about God, and we learn about ourselves and our interaction with God, and what that means for us. Icons do with color what scripture does with words. Now I could go on and on about different icons if I had other slides and other things to do, but I won't tonight. Maybe another time. I'm going to give it over to uh, Dr. Arthur White, who's going to talk about art after iconography and tying those, those things together. Uh, but thank you so much for your attention. And at the end, um, at the end, we'll have some time for, for extra questions. So I want to make sure Arthur has his time, and then both of us will stand up and be ready for questions uh, at, at the very end. Okay? Thank you very much.
What would it be like to be there and see this? What would it be like to see Lazarus walk out of the tomb? What would it be like to see someone healed? And, and this physical uh, emphasis uh, was also paired with uh, an emotional emphasis. St. Francis said uh, that the tears of, of those who hear the preaching tells you how effective the preaching has been. And so we get a different...